This episode was sponsored by Critical Dice and the Endless Bag of Dice. Welcome to the Compendium, a resource designed to help you spend less time learning D&D and more time actually playing. Welcome back to the Compendium. Uh, this week I am joined by a secondary host, so I've got my host as always, Jason, and then I've also got Cameron Ackerson from the D&D Coalition, because we are doing a side quest this week, and I'm really excited to just have a, a discussion with two other D&D nerds about the top challenges that people who play D&D face in the game, or running the game, or playing in the game. So Cameron, do you want to introduce yourself a little bit and kind of tell people what the Coalition is in case they're interested? Yeah, absolutely. Hello, everybody. My name is Cameron Ackerson. Uh, I am a fellow nerd. Uh, a while back, I started this group called the D&D Coalition. Uh, and essentially, it's just this collaborative place for content creators. And uh, we bounce ideas off one another. Um, and yeah, a lot of collaborations. Yeah, it's a great resource for anyone that's just looking for inspiration on basically anything. Um, so definitely check it out. We'll put a link to the coalition in the show notes so you can find it there. Um, but yeah, so we've been covering all of the rules for a while now, Jason. Um, we just finished the races in the player's handbook. Both of us needed a little bit of a breath from kind of just like going through the rules and hitting the road with all of that. And so we wanted to do something different and take a side quest this week. And so what I did is I went out to some D&D groups that I'm on on Facebook and anonymously asked, hey, what's your number one challenge playing D&D? And I got some really great responses. And so I just want to talk through those and share our own experiences with maybe similar problems and offer suggestions for people that are dealing with the same thing that they might be able to try or implement at their table to make gameplay a little bit easier or kind of bring the fun back into it again. Sound good? Yeah, sounds good. All right. So the very first question on that note is ensuring how to ensure that everyone, including the DM, is having fun. That's a really good one. Yeah, it is. Written like a true DM. <laughs> yeah. So that's, I think, the, the, the biggest elephant in the room, you know, is that delicate dance, making sure that everybody equally feels autonomous and heard. Uh, and also, like, the DM feels appreciated. So I think from a DM standpoint, uh, selfishly, of course, I would say <laughs> express gratitude towards your dungeon master. And that right there alone will instantly make the DM feel like, oh, this is worth it. They really appreciate mm -hmm. all the time I'm putting into this. So for players, that's an easy one. But for a dungeon master, that's definitely a little more tricky. Right. Yeah, for sure. And I think also, too, like uh, Cameron was saying, like the communication, but also um, I'm a big advocate of setting the tone or uh, preemptive uh, kind of action, you know, the the uh, ounce of prevention versus the pound of cure and uh, setting up the expectation at the beginning of the game and reminding them that this is a collaborative storytelling game and that this is something we do together and that as the players they have a really powerful um, resource which is the power of choice and with that choice they have now a responsibility like spider-man great power great responsibility uh, to use that choice to tell a great story and to make sure everyone's having fun and hopefully that will mitigate people who are kind of like running off and doing their own thing and that causes the rest of the table to kind of groan and frustrates the the dm or uh, other you know kind of common behaviors and so i think just setting that expectation is goes a long long way and then if they all agree to it and then there's a problem down the road you can say hey remember how we talked about this and how i bring it up like every couple of sessions yeah so that's not really happening for me right now and i wonder if you could help me and, and having those kind of conversations. I know that's hard because there's a lot of D&D players who hate uh, social confrontation. Uh, and uh, it's just one of the many, many skills you get to learn while playing Dungeons and Dragons, not just math. Yeah, yeah I, I had an issue with, I don't wanna say an issue, but I had a similar situation with one of my games where it seemed like my players were just like not having a good time. 
And so I basically brought it up. I was like, hey, are you guys like not taking my homebrew? Cause I can come up with something else for you. You seem like you just don't <laughs> wanna have anything to do with this. And what it was is that they were just really deep into role play because their characters were in this situation that their characters would not want to be in. And so they were basically wanting to like get out of the circumstances because of the character. And once I knew that, it made it a lot easier for me to go back to having fun instead of feeling like everything I was doing, people were going to hate because I realized that they were actually super into it. It was just being perceived incorrectly on my end as a DM. Yeah, and that's uh, you gotta watch out for that too because from a DM standpoint, you know we're behind here. We have all the answers, and it's really hard sometimes to read your players' faces. And I think one actionable thing that you can do is, and this is actually for my player, uh, he he told me he said, "You ask basic questions, you're gonna get basic answers." So ask your players. One thing that I do is like if I notice a specific player that if they're really into like a, like what we're doing at that time. I'm going to write down and make a note. So like, okay, Natalia, she really likes it whenever I bring up notes about her uh, family and her character's backstory. So then that's one thing that I know, like as soon as I start mentioning that, she's hooked, she's in. And then, you know, Alan, he really likes it whenever we talk about different magic items and discovering things. So taking notes like that, but then also just asking them, you know, hey, what do you guys want to see more of? More magic items? Do you want more lore, background, story? What would you like to see more of? Right. Um, I think that is really, I mean, it's going to be hard because I think everything we're going to talk about today is going to boil down to like communication, which sounds really nice and fluffy, but it's really hard to do in real life. And so uh, that's going to be the baseline here. But hopefully with some of those suggestions, like you had, like, hey, look at your character sheets, pull out some like nuggets of information that's going to show your players that you were thinking about them and you're sprinkling their backstory into your campaign and kind of draw them in organically is, is really great. Um, on that same note, another question that somebody had or another problem that somebody had is taking notes during the game. And I am terrible at this. I want to be so good at this and I am terrible. I have great intentions at the beginning of every game to take awesome notes. So when we pick up the next week, I can like seamlessly Matt Mercer my way into the like previously on and right. I fail every time. And so what do you guys do to kind of remember what's happening in your campaigns or keep things flowing really well without having to ask your players like, so wait, what did we do last week? <laughs> Something about a door and a mimic and, oh wait, I wasn't supposed to say that. Uh, and <laughs> oh no, that's room. tonight, oops. <laughs> yeah. uh, so personally, I keep uh, a World Anvil log. So I'll go back and write like a, uh, a recap of everything that like we did and for me it's like it's also as much for my enjoyment um but i guess where it really came from is like as a kid growing up we had all these memories and all these stories and all these plot hooks and i wish we would have documented them better and so now when i play with my crew you know we had jason down here in florida a few months back and uh i wrote a recap for the session and you know years from now we can reminisce on that i can read through and remember birch wayfield the half flame barbarian that was part of the crew <laughs> so much fun yeah uh one of the things that i do because taking notes is hard for me is and, and this is really simple but honestly take your phone out and like on my iphone i just have the memo app and i hit record then put it on an airplane mode and i just lay it on the table uh, and I, you know, depending on where you are, what state, that could be illegal if you don't tell your players. So, you know, uh, but if you're worried um, about them taking offense to that or whatever, it's just like, hey, so what this is for, so I can during the week or like the day before the next session, go back and listen to it and remember how I pronounced that guy's name and remember where we left off. And also you get a sense of the tone of it because you can hear the silence at the table or the, them getting rowdy at the tavern or whatever it is. And then also, also if you have a player who missed that session, guess what? You can just send them the file and they can listen to hear what happened and they're back on the same page. And it, the, the quality is actually decent. I mean, it's not podcast quality, but I still have a recordings of games I did a year ago before the dark times that I go back and listen to just for fun because I'm just, you know, having a nostalgia quake and enjoying hearing, uh, you know, them defeat the drow inside the extinct caldera of the volcano, you know? And so it's, it's a, a really, really easy way, especially if writing and note-taking doesn't come easy to you. Yeah, well, I remember as you were talking, I was like, oh, yeah, you sent me one of those before I had any clue what I was doing with being a DM. 
Yeah, because you like, said like I wanted here, to hear how a session, session works. that's not Matt Mercer. That was why you did it. Is you're like, have yeah. you ever heard of the Matt Mercer effect? And I was like, mm-hmm. no, what is that? And you're like, here's what real D and D sounds like. And okay, you no, 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 no. Here's what non-professional D and D sounds like. I am <laughs> okay, not fine. suggesting that my games are the platonic ideal of D and D games. But thank you. <laughs> I'll accept that compliment. Then redirect. Wonderful. Yeah, and I. Was- <laughs> I would say, like, as far as, like, a DM goes, like, making those memorable moments, lean into your strengths. You know, if you're good at art, you know, maybe make up a quick sketch of something or, if you know, graphic design a little bit, throw together a little graphic. Uh, You know, use those tools at your disposal. Right, yeah, because, I mean, even, like, just the way that people learn is so different. Like, being an auditory learner versus visual, like, you know, listening to something might be a lot easier to actually bring into the mix than otherwise. So that's a really good point, too. And to that note, um, you can see, let me see if I can pull this up real fast. There it is. Uh, so this is just something from like our last session that we did. And I've got a TV right behind me. My table is right in front of me. So I can use the TV. What I do is I screencast uh, little graphics that I, I make. Um, oh, I can't script share my screen. But basically, I just like uh, little graphics that I make in Keynote, honestly. And um, they can have like a, a backdrop, like maybe the name of the tavern along with like a picture of the NPC. Uh, super simple. Oh, that's cool. Yeah, and it really does help with, you know, word association, remembering names, locations, and stuff like that. Yeah, I remember when I was at your table back in, what was it, December? That was mm-hmm. really cool. I knew a lot of people did that, but I didn't understand the power of having those almost like dossier files, you know, of reinforcing what they look like. And a lot of that stuff is coming straight from D&D Beyond or the source books yep. themselves. And uh, and it was just really great visual reinforcement, which is uh, sometimes hard to do in D&D. And I, I really love that you did that. So that's actually a great segue into one of the next pain points, which is game prep ahead of time. And I think this is going to be a really great conversation um, because, Jason, I know your prep style and my prep style are mm-hmm. on complete opposite ends of the spectrum and Cameron I have no idea where you stand on how you prep your games and so like what do you guys do when you're trying to prepare for the upcoming story for your campaign and and how long do you allot for that do you schedule it for yourself so, like just like kind of what's your routine with with prepping for your games well Jason has no input on this because I've seen his notes before and that man's mind is wicked <laughs> I don't know how the heck he remembers everything he does. You've seen the like half of a scribbled post-it note? <laughs> yes. <as> his notes? <laughs> hey, there are word documents, thank you very much. <laughs> it'll be like a sentence with maybe a couple bullet points, and then it'll be like, you know, an hour long dialogue or, you know, hour long situation right? that he remembers. I don't know how he does head. it. <laughs> just like, yeah, that that's what I got from that little tiny word. It's, <laughs> it's just mnemonic. Don't worry about it. Anyway. <laughs> I would say the the one thing that if I could recommend anything is make your notes accessible. Make them quick. Make them uh, organized to a point where, like, if you need to if you need to remember the NPC's name or whatever, have your stuff organized in a manner that you can quickly pull it up. Right. Yeah. How do you how do you go about getting that stuff together though? Like just thinking about what you'll need. I mean, even right now I'm running through Curse of Strahd with my group and it's hard because it's it's basically sandbox. And since I didn't create the world, I'm like, I don't know what chapter I need to read next. Are they going to go here? Are they going to go here? What are they going to do that could ripple effect to somewhere else? And so I think like that premeditated, like how do you decide what's important to prepare? So this is actually advice from Anthony. I don't remember exactly what context he uh, he put it in, but submerge yourself in the moment. Make your put yourself like okay, where did your last session like leave off? If you just left off, where you know there's a big battle that's about to happen there, feed into that. You know, dive into those emotions, those situations, or say they're in a war ravaged town. You know, put things in there that they might see as they're walking through the streets. You know, like. Not to be morbid, but you know, like a line of dead bodies mm-hmm. people on the street, just dead. Like the ambience, basically. Yeah. yeah, and you'll be amazed at like what your players will pick up on and like what they'll do. And sometimes you'll have a situation prepared and they won't bite into it, but sometimes they will, and it'll be magical. And then next thing you know, you had something this big in your notes prepared, and that takes you two hours of the night. Right. Yeah, so Jason, it, would you like to shed light on your your prepping style now that we've alluded to it slightly? 
Yeah, like, so first you get a you get a a, a, a a big <laughs> ball of red string and a cork board. Um, uh, there you, know, you go, folks. <laughs> uh, no, so what he's referring to is basically I take very minimal notes. Most of my notes are proper names, like people and places, and then like maybe a, a one sentence like um, like mission statement of the adventure, and then the rest of it I just have it in my head. I, I know what I want to do and I know what's going out uh, on other places. Um, and a lot of it is like to, you know, Cameron mentioned some cryptic scrawlings, but it'll be just like a single <laughs> word or phrase that triggers something in my brain that is much, much bigger. So it's all these mnemonic things. Um, and it might be just like, oh, this character's voice sounds like Zoidberg. And so I'll just write Zoidberg, you know, or, um, uh, or this situation is l like in Hardy Boys uh, issue number 37 in that book when they go to the Old West. Like, you know, and so it's just kind of a way to index the, the stuff that's in my head. And that works for me, but that, that hits on Cameron's point of make it accessible. So whatever it is you do, because I'm very like general thinker, and so I just kind of like flow with the stuff. And Casey, I know that you're very specific and, and um, detailed planner, but just don't do planning that is going to bog you down. So if you're general, don't try to be specific. You'll get lost in your notes. If you're specific, don't try to do general or you'll feel unprepared and just kind of crazy, and you'll have an anxiety going into the game. And don't be like, clever and like try to be vague when you need some really hardcore like details and you have kind of shot yourself in the foot so just find the the rhythm that works for you whether that's world anvil or that's you know uh, writing yourself notes in a word document or your phone or leaving yourself little audio messages or whatever it is uh, a flow chart i've seen that before too because uh, then you know that if this doesn't happen then you can bounce to these two other options um, I, I think uh, you can see some of that thinking in both Against the Giants, I think, or, or Storm King's Thunder, and also in uh, Waterdeep. There's a literal flowchart based on when the adventure begins and what happens that you follow to uh, do that uh, official campaign. So it, it really is about accessibility and what works for the person. Yeah, I know for me, I actually prefer not to use um, pre-written modules. Yeah, because when I homebrew something, I feel like I don't have to worry too much about game prep because it's kind of like I know the world so intimately because I created it. So right. it's not the same as a pre-written module where, you know, you can't possibly unless you're, you know, Albert Einstein or something, mm -hmm. you can't remember everything that is in that module in that world, how it all interconnects. And so there's going to be that, I think for me, that causes anxiety. And so mm -hmm. I'm doing Stroud on purpose because like I'm leaning into my fears and like m challenging myself to try to learn that process and kind of grow and develop with, with that area. But I like homebrews specifically for that reason is I don't feel like I have to do as much game prep. Right. Cause you can't be wrong. Cause you made it. Are yeah. <laughs> You know, well, you unless you're super something. hyper analytical like I am, <laughs> in which case you can tell yourself that yes, you were wrong, which is just a whole nother story. But yeah, totally. So like yeah. I know, like Cameron, you're you're going through, or you were going through Neverwinter, right? Uh, we did Storm King Thunder, but we're doing uh, Icewind Dale right now. We're Icewind Dale, yeah, that's it. Yeah, Icewind Dale. So uh, how is that for you doing uh, prepared material versus like homebrew stuff? Like, what's your what's your speed? So yeah, and I was actually going to say, Cass, this is something I'd implore you to do. Um, so what really helps me with the prepared material, I, do, I love the modules because it kind of gives you like a framework. It kind of gives you like, for me, it gives me the footwork of things that I don't want to do. Mm -hmm. So uh, I can have like a big broad picture. So what I would implore you to do is next time like you're on a module, even with Curse of Strahd, is get the general idea of it. You know, don't study the book, but get the general idea of the campaign and make things your own. And then what you'll do is the further you, you go along, it's so like, you know, the very beginning, know, get a good idea of the first couple chapters and then make it your own. And then, you know, maybe read the next couple of chapters. And what you're gonna find is like these plot hooks that were your own, what were your own homebrew things are indefinitely gonna tie in somewhere in the module. So then, you know, what you can do is like, okay, this captain, the guard, that's supposed to be a really prominent figure in chapter five, holy cow, Captain Argleth that I just had them introduced and they've really made a connection with, maybe I can make that her. And then so you can kind of take your own creation and then kind of plug it into mm -hmm. kind of do like overall. an overlay. Yeah, exactly. That's what really helps me, 
you know, especially something like Storm King, so it's a huge module. Yeah, I yeah. so one of my players in Strahd actually has run Strahd and he always wanted to play it. And so I was like, well, this is interesting because you're intimately familiar with the story. Um, and so at one point I completely homebrewed an entire section of it just to kind of throw him off is because I knew he knew what was supposed to happen. And at certain points he had unintentionally metagamed with what he was doing or where he was going. And so I just completely homebrewed it. And honestly, that was one of the most fun sessions that I had. And it was exactly that. It's where I took this concept and I'm like, nope, this isn't what's going to happen. I'm going to use these elements and then put this completely different story to it. Um, And it was great. It was actually a lot of fun. Nice. Um, So with running on that stream again, um, how do you guys deal with uh, unexpected situations that come up during gameplay, like when a player does something you didn't anticipate, and now you have to define what happens as a result, like on the spot, heat of the moment. Um, how do you how do you guys usually handle that? Do you have a system in place? Have you just done it long enough that you're really good with backup plans? Like, how do you usually navigate that? Hmm. Yes, and always. <laughs> always encourage that type of behavior you know if they do something that's off the wall don't punish them for it like revel in it you know let it you can always let the dice decide but uh and there's never anything wrong with saying okay we're gonna take a quick break and jason taught me that um there's nothing wrong with with you know stepping away from and saying i really need to think about this for a minute because you're playing i mean you're not like in front of a live studio audience or if you are on a live stream whatever then you guys cut to break early But don't be afraid to walk away for a second and collect your thoughts. Yeah, you're only human. And I I think for for me, when things unexpectedly happen, I actually kind of revel in that. I have a pretty high tolerance for chaos, and and I kind of enjoy it. And it it is like Cameron alluded alluded to, uh, that is yes and, uh, which is like the rule number one for improv, which D&D largely is, even if with a pre-written adventure it's still going to be improv to a certain degree. And so rolling with it or uh, kind of like uh, finding the right point on the spectrum between rule of cool and you can certainly try, which is kind of like on one end is that's a stupid idea and I love it. Let's do it. I can't believe you insane person did this at my table. Let's roll with it. (laughs) And the other side of you can certainly try, which is immersorism, which is you fool, you're going to reap the consequences of your actions. Let's see where this goes. Like, I hate I all of this. I that says that that I often wear on TV yeah. nights. <laughs> right, where you can find the spectrum in that where you're just like, well, this isn't what I thought I'd be doing tonight, but you know what? Let's see what happens, whether it's mm-hmm. going to be awesome or it's going to teach them a lesson. Um, so either way, um, but yeah, uh, like Cameron said, it's okay to go, all right, that's kind of interesting. Um, Let's jump over to this right now, and you and you know, because someone else was, was said, "Oh, I also wanted to do this." Okay, great. Let's, let's do that first, and you can think about it, or you can just take a break, um, uh, or in the session if it's too early. That's quite all right. Um, you are still human, and you're allowed to to be human. So yeah, I think there's also. I mean, this can be pretty minuscule too. I have a tendency to make mountains out of molehills sometimes mm. with this, and Jason, that's one of the things like that you kind of I think unintentionally taught me was that idea of like, if you don't know, they might not know either. So Mm -hmm. if you're like, oh, there's some people, you know, at the tavern talking in the corner. Well, what are they saying? It's in a language you don't speak. Well, what language is it? Uh, You don't speak it. You don't speak it. How would you know? And so moments like that, I go into a panic stop? mode of like, yeah. oh my gosh, what are the different yeah. languages in D&D? And I need to figure out which one this is. And then what is that going to lead into? And does that affect the characters that they are? When the reality is just like, you don't know. Like, yeah. It can sometimes be as simple as like, you don't know the answer. And so like, well, I like you, there would be no way for me to define that to you because in world, who's to say? Yeah, they're like, it's a language you don't understand. Well, what language? Did I stutter? Yeah. I said it's a language you don't <laughs> understand. No, don't, you don't have to bring that energy. But but yeah, exactly. It's 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 okay to, to, to not know uh, because not everything in the world is for them or even level appropriate for them. Um, but I mean, there was a joke going around like about a year and a half ago about Sam Snorkel, the, uh, goblin, right? Where it's like, you describe the, the obvious person who's going to give you the quest in the tavern 
And then they're like, well, who else is here? Like, oh, there's a goblin named Sam Snorkel. We want to talk to Sam Snorkel. Like, of course you do. Guess what? Mm -hmm. Now Sam Snorkel, he has that quest for them. Right. And, and I'm really guy... bad at that in the moment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's another really good tactic, actually, is like, don't be afraid to, don't be married, don't be so married to your content that mm -hmm. you can't just mix it up like that. Yeah. That's right. a good piece of advice. Yeah, and I mean, one of the things you always say, Jason, is that, I mean, it's a quote from, I forget who it is, but the story moves at the speed of plot. Yeah, that's, I think it's from, I, I want to say, one of the sci-fi shows, they're like, well, how fast do the, the, the uh, you know, the, the basically the spaceship fighters uh, fly, because it seems inconsistent from show to show. It's like, well, they, they fly at the speed of plot. They get there when they need to get there, either just in time to save the day or just too late to kind of survey the carnage and have a, a deep emotional plot building moment that's how fast they get there. It's, it's, it's like Gandalf, right? A wizard arrives exactly when he means to. And so does the story. So does the information that you need, whether or not it's from this person or that person. Right. Yeah. Uh, so next I want to talk about uh, a challenge, number one challenge of another person was players that, prefer, that preferred to solve everything with violence, also known as murder hobos. Yeah, I choose so violence. <laughs> And I mean, this is multifaceted because it's not just murder hobos. It's the people that forget that there could be deeper level of story. Mm -hmm. And I've had this happen in one of my campaigns where like all these people, I had all this information they were going to give them about what's going on in the story. And they just obliterated everyone. And I was left in the weird position of like, well, you killed everyone that could have told you this. And so now I don't know how to give you this information. And the story's not going to make sense. And you're not going to be able to progress. So what do I do? Because you killed them all. Um, and so how do you guys handle that, you know, either from the sake of people that are just like combat enthusiasts and just want to murder hobo versus the people that are just like, kill first, ask questions later? Have you run into this? Like, what do you usually do to manage it? I like I like the alternate term for murder hobo is combat enthusiast. That's really good. Um, <laughs> I like that. I so this is a great question, and this is like a, a very well known problem. So two ways that I always deal with it is number one, you can always recycle content. You can always keep what you had in store for those people and implement it later down the road in a different light or whatever. Um, once again, don't be so married to your, your notes and your content that you can't deviate from it. So you can always recycle content, but number two, enforce consequences. So yeah. going back to one of my players, uh, you know, the one that Natalia, who really likes backstories involvement, um, they did this. They murder hoboed a bunch of people, didn't question anybody, and I even warned them about it. Uh, make sure you gather intelligence. And then so five or six sessions later, they found out that one of that piece of advice that they told them to is, hey, go check the dungeon. And Natalia found out that her sister was a prisoner there. And then they even had it written down their notes and like they even knew that it was said, they remembered it and they're just like, are you kidding? We missed that. And then it was just this kind of like aha moment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it really is about teaching the table that you're at the expectations, right? And you can do that directly, but you also can do it indirectly. And there's a force way and a finesse way of doing it. Um, if you want to like give them kind of cute names, you can do the finesse way, which is like the friendly monster. And the brute force way is the kung fu master. So the friendly monster, I do this a lot in my Monster of the Week game, where I go out of my way early on to show them that not all the things that are like the monsters are fighting are really monsters. So there's always two options that there is um, there is an opportunity to befriend a foe and defeat them that way, and to murder a foe and defeat them that way. One gains you an ally, one just kind of is fun. Um, Both gain you XP in most circumstances, people. Yes, that is do. important. Everyone yes, remember do. this DM tip. You will right. probably get XP whether or not you kill the creature. It's not dependent on murdering. <laughs> Right. So, I mean, you could set up in the very first session or in a new arc or a new campaign that, you know, the guy that they're fighting who's like, you know, the the leader of the, you know, the, the Knoll army that's going to be attacking the town who in the midst of the end of the battle, he just gives up and starts crying. And they're like, um, I am no longer having fun. This is awkward. And he like asked for their help because he was forced into this because the real bad guy 
has his family or something like that, right? Where they realize that, well, we don't trust this guy, but he had his own motivations, which now we know them are justifiable in his uh, his circumstance. And so maybe there is a reason to uh, to talk to a bad guy or talk to a foe to kind of uh, uh, understand where they're coming from. And sometimes DMs, uh, we shoot ourselves in the foot and we don't give our bad guys motivations. A goblin's just a goblin, an orc's just an orc, a mimic's just a mimic. There are variants in older editions of smart mimics that can talk to you. You know, like, because they don't have a rich inner life, the players start to expect through osmosis that there's no rich inner life, so why would we talk to them? They're simply there for me to stick sharp pieces of metal into. <laughs> so why would I talk to them? So you can teach them the passive way, the kind of, is your dog giving you trouble? There was a, I have it right on my shelf over here. Jason actually gifted this book to me. Oh. It's called, uh, Know Your Mon- or The Monsters Know What They're Doing. Mm-hmm. Right. Yeah, we did and, an interview with Keith, actually. It was fabulous. Yes, the author, yeah. That's a great book, and it does provide a lot of perspective with stuff like that, which is yeah. another awesome way to do it. And then the other way, on the other side of that spectrum, is the Kung Fu Master, uh, kind of taking a cue from, this is the brute force way to teach them a lesson, going from old school Kung Fu movies, where the hot shot punk protagonist, who's not ready yet, thinks he is, and challenges the Kung Fu Master, and just trounces the guy just trounces the the hero until he decides to finally give up and learn what the master has to teach and so you can have a bad guy who has information who you just have basically statted up so he can't be defeated and will just like knock out the whole party and they're like did you just tpk us it's like well actually a few hours later you guys all wake up and the guy's just sitting on the chair waiting for you guys to wake up and you can see some of your bandages your wounds have been bandaged uh you can taste like healing potion on your lips and he says are you ready to talk now have you learned your lesson and they attack him again he can just do it again until they realize like okay we can't beat this guy and he clearly could destroy us but he's not so all right what is it that you have to tell us so it's a very overt way of teaching your party that sometimes the bad guys have things to tell you and the solution isn't always murder um so yeah there's a couple of ways to just set that expectation and, and break that cycle of murder hobo hobodum murder hobodum murder hobodum it's <laughs> a word now I'm We're coming up with all kinds statement. of new terms in this episode. Yeah, that's going to be a great clip for for Instagram. All right. <laughs> I will. T- so I would totally second that, though. If you ever do need to, I don't want to say bring your players down a notch, you know, because you want to bring like good good energy to the table. Yeah, healthy but, dose uh, of reality. Yeah, yeah, you you want to be a fan of your players for sure, but like sometimes you got to like recalibrate. I, I'm exactly. a fan of my child, but sometimes he needs to get hurt to understand why he shouldn't do something. <laughs> yeah, don't exactly. climb on the counter. Yeah. Sometimes you got to touch the stove to know it's hot. You know? Yeah, mm-hmm. see? Same principle here. Um, okay, so when you do actually intend to have combat, um, I know, Jason, you and I have talked about this immensely, even like in episode and off episode. How do you, how do you uh, balance your combat encounters to make them challenging? And this particular person mentions specifically smart players, which I tend to have a lot of very clever people or people like Jason and probably Cameron, who are very good at building characters that aren't broken, but are maybe on the edge. Um, So I I may have done that a few times. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, I'm guilty. Um, So what do you guys do when you're trying to figure out or kind of pre planning or even in the moment? Like, how do you go through the steps of balancing an encounter so that it's fun? It's challenging. It has that air of like, we might not make it out alive because if every time the players just think the yeah, it's, it's just a combat and we're going to move on. There's really no fun in it anymore. Um, so what do you guys do with that? Trial and error is always a, you know, that's always kind of the best way to learn. You know, you learn from experience. But I would say just be prepared for other circumstances. So like for me, I've got, you know, like my side of the table here. I'll always keep like a couple extra minis just on mm-hmm. deck, you know, because we use train and stuff like that. And like if it's too challenging and they're breezing through it, okay, well, a number hawk walks in. Uh, or, you know, not like situations, they make, have it makes sense, but just be prepared for that scenario. And on the flip side too, you know, if it is a little bit too difficult, make sure you give them that scapegoat of, you know, with the NPC that, you know, shows up that they had helped a couple of sessions back, whatever, 
but I would say definitely be prepared for an audible, whether it's helping them or making it more challenging. Yeah. So it sounds like you're kind of aiming conceptually for the, the idea of like, uh, quantity, right? Mm -hmm. So like, make sure that you have a set number of, of foes that you're going to encounter, but then you have a couple more that you could throw in, or you're able to reduce in some way, or you have like another like ally or some scenario that could come in and help. So you're kind of thinking like almost like a numbers game of like having like addition, subtraction. Yeah. And really like the way that I kind of gauge combat isn't necessarily difficulty. It's, uh, and it's, it's really, it's enjoyment. Um, if I know that I want to get through this specific combat because they've got more in store, then that foe might hit a little bit harder, but be a little bit squishier. Um, or vice versa, you know, make it, if, it, if I feel like it's a little bit too drawn out, then maybe have a part of the ceiling collapse and make him make a dexterity saving throw. Uh, and then maybe one of the characters gets restrained instantly a battle, you know, three versus one became two versus one and mm -hmm. they're all damaged. So things like that can really up the ante and, you know, instill that panic. <laughs> yeah. To like kind of piggyback on Cameron's uh, thought is like, your encounter doesn't have to have everyone on the stage at the same time. And I know we've talked about this before, Casey, but like you can say, if you kind of suspect that this might be too easy, you can always intend to have two more of that same monster or related monster around the corner who after a few rounds and you judge you're like, oh yeah, this is kind of a cakewalk. They're going to come around the corner. But if you're realizing like, oh, I miss, I totally didn't realize that none of my characters are good at wisdom saves and these monsters do wisdom saves so those two extra ones around the corner they just never existed because they're going to get out of this thing with the skin of their teeth um and then in a, and and i think too uh, what cameron cameron kind of kind of said like after a while you get a sense of it you know of like what's going to be too easy too hard and I love your comment too, Cameron, about just like, well, was it fun? Like, is this going to be enjoyable? Right. Is it going to be interesting? Is it going to present a, a problem or an obstacle that's more than just uh, they take a turn and they attack? They take a turn and they attack and rinse and repeat. There's, there's more interesting mechanics going on that you can utilize. But also, too, uh, very practically, both Xanathar's Guide has a really great and really useful CR-based um, uh, table uh, to, to uh, kind of set up your combat encounters based on the number of players and their levels. And then also, um, I might still be in beta, but I think everyone has access to it, to the campaign builder in Dean to Beyond, which I think uses some of those same, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that same table, but just in a digital format where you can just say, are 11 goblins too much? Oh, they are. Okay, this says everyone's going to die. I should kind of dial that back. Um, I think it might be one of the listings on the bottom of the page. Uh, but uh, yeah, so the campaign planner on D&D Beyond really helps too. That's what I use personally, and it's awesome. I love it. Right on. Yeah, and I mean, you and I, Jason, have talked a little bit about how sometimes I feel like the action economy in 5e isn't always correct, that sometimes those ratios aren't challenging enough. Um, mm -hmm. But as you mentioned, usually, um, and this was actually kind of another question on here, is like how often should you have combat encounters during you know a session or something like that um usually you're you should have two or three combat scenarios in between long rests and so by the time that you're getting towards those last ones i mean i mean again depending on your homebrew story there's lots of variables here this is just very like a cookie cutter concept mm -hmm. here yeah but by that last one your party should be low on spell slots they should be low on hit dice there should be some areas where they're now going to have to start thinking more strategically because they're kind of getting to the point that if they get hit too much, they could actually, like their character could die. Mm -hmm. And so you could structure it where, you know, maybe the first two encounters of the night or of the, you know, D&D 24 hour day aren't that challenging. They're just fun. You just throw some stuff at them to get the, you know, the players warmed up. But then as you go on the last one or two before the long rest, that's where you start to kind of throw in some strategic maneuvers or some other things. Um, and so it's not necessarily just about combat. You have to think before and after about where they're going to be, their character is going to be at kind of in this, this situation. Yeah, exactly. And so often people don't build their kind of narrative arcs with a lot of um, 
obstacles. I don't want to say like combats, but just obstacles. That could be traps. That could be social interactions. That can be combat. Mm-hmm. Um, and they're like, wow, like this is just really underpowered. And you're like, yeah, but there's supposed to be four of those before they got to the long rest. And they're like, oh, I did two. No wonder. So if you know you're only going to do two, crank that thing up, man. You know? Right. Um, and then also take that into account that if you want to have – you know, if they're fighting, like, if they've had, like, four encounters with kind of really easy combatants, like, you know, goblins or something, that means that they've been slowly worn down a little mm-hmm. bit, but not pronouncedly, and they're feeling pretty good about themselves. And then the BBEG is just a demi lich, and you're like, oh, okay. <laughs> I, I'm in Run danger away. <laughs> now. Yeah. Um, so, uh, so you can crank that and kind of balance shift that for dramatic effect, too, which is really a lot of fun, where they're like, all right, this is easy. And then you're like, well... I have all these other, you know, challenge rating points left over for the final battle. I'm going to put them all in one big thing, you know. So uh, there's a lot of ways to do that. But, yeah. Right. One person who's really good at making combat uh, exciting is Chris Solo. With the yeah. Record. He really does a yeah. good job. I always enjoyed his combat set- setups. Yeah, I, I, mean, I think that's, that's actually a good point too. Is watch other people like go online mm-hmm. and watch D and D games, or listen to D and D podcasts where people are playing, and just see what they do and how it works out, and then just kind of absorb that knowledge. Yeah, there are, exactly. There are other DMs out there than Matt Mercer, and he is a yeah. fantastic specimen. But I will say there are uh, the way that he facilitates combat is very descriptive and intense. However, I will say there's a lot of other DMs out there that I will say are better at the whole combat, you know, keeping it interesting, keeping it challenging. Mm-hmm. Um, so just keep that in mind. Awesome. Um, a, a little bit, another kind of like subset question there. And this is actually somebody that is on our Patreon um, that asked this question when I kind of posed the same question to them. And I struggle with this too. So I'm really glad that they brought this up. How do you keep track of NPC combatants when they're minis? <laughs> Like, right at the table. So, Cameron, I'm going to throw this one at you because you do some amazing stuff with your terrain yeah, and you your do. minis. Like, <laughs> this is 100% in your court. I found a method that is working better for me than it had been. But what do you do, especially when you've got more than one or two bad guys that are attacking? You know, you've got 15 goblins coming at them from all direction. How do you keep track of whose hit points are down, which one already hit? Like, how do you run that? Yeah. Honestly, it's just practice. Like I remember the first time I had a, a combat that uh, was like three enemies. I remember I was just like totally like confused. I had no idea what the hell I was doing. So I actually bought, I don't have many more, but I actually bought like these little uh, dots. Like they're different colors. There's like four colors. It's like blue, pink, yellow, and orange. Yeah, you can get them at the dollar store, right? Yeah, at the dollar store, wherever. And so I would like put a little dot on the base of the mini. And then I would, you know, on my little scratch piece of paper, I'd have to keep like a thing, a, you know, a little scratch pad like this or something. I would just have a B for blue, P for pink. And that's how I'd keep track of it. Um, the D&D Beyond Encounter Builder thing is awesome. It, it works very well. Uh, but I think for me, spatially, so like if I know that I've got baddies on different sides of the of the bat of the battlefield, I will kind of like, you know, there's not really a rhyme or reason to this, but like, you know, if one of the guys on the far end of the battlefield, I might put it at the very top. And then the other guy at the very bottom. Mm-hmm. So it's just uh it's just doing things in a way that you're not gonna set yourself up for failure. You don't go so big that you know you're gonna like just forget everything. Um and ultimately, too, like if you're stressed about it and you're not keeping track of things either, your par- your players will pick up on that, and then you can lose a little bit of credibility. So, don't be afraid to. I don't want to say take the easy route, but you know, stick with just that one ice troll, and then really, really, really dive on in with it, and you know, throw things in there like uh, different other sorts of challenges, like Jason was saying. You know, whether it's like a a slippery floor or a collapsing stalactite. Uh, you know, things like that, you can also escalate the combat. But yeah, I would say um, markers and stuff like that, those things help too. But right. really, that's, it's just repetition. Yeah, that's basically what I ended up doing is when I started painting minis, I painted all their clothes different colors. So especially my goblins, because mm-hmm. you have, I mean, mm-hmm. you always have more than one goblin. Um, I painted all of their clothes different colors, and then I painted a ring around the base of them that matched the color. And so when people were attacking, I'd be like, which one, which color? they will be like the orange one or the blue one and it was it was easier for me because i did kind of the same thing where i just went through and i marked down like the color Mm -hmm. code i mean i started running out of colors when you have that many goblins Mm -hmm. but you can just do your best the other option which 
may or may not be easier is you can invoke mob mechanics, right? Mm -hmm. Where you can just, if you have enough of them, you can just do kind of a, a variable rate and be like, oh, well, 50% of them are gonna hit these are the ones that hit, you know, and so you're not even having to track multiple ones. And then you can just track your big bad, kind of like you were saying, Cameron. So you may be able to like break that up. And lastly, your players are there too. Like if you need help, you can ask your players for help. Like you could say, hey, you know, running this combat, this is a lot of bad guys. Can you help me keep track? Or can you run these three bad guys as well as your character? Right. And so don't, don't necessarily take on all the load if you don't have to. There might be a way that you can offload some of that or delegate some of that responsibility to your players that's not going to ruin the facade of, you know, the secrecy of the game or the story. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Cameron, you were holding up those sheets. What, what, were, you, what were those? Yeah. So this was a big, giant, epic encounter that we did that basically the town was being attacked by, attacked by a dragon. And like they obviously were not going to defeat a dragon at, you know, fifth level, sixth level, whatever they were. So I did is I had like, this is a ballista. I gave this one of my players to run the ballista and it won his turn on initiative. One of the guys, uh, there's this like orc that he can summon through his magic item that he had, which he actually ended up not using. So it didn't come into play, but I had it prepared anyways. Right. And this is just like two NPCs that I gave them stat blocks to and just hand these out to the players. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's a great idea. Like, like in my experience, players love handouts, and especially if it's like, now we're doing a nautical battle. Who wants to man the cannons? Oh, I do. <laughs> you know, you hand that sheet to them, right? The uh, the uh, Hellfire machines in uh, Vernus uh, has that, where you can man different things, and man, that's just awesome when you can do that kind of stuff. Like a little ad like addendum with this too is I do what Cameron does as well. Like I will put. Um, the hit point totals different places on my sheet of paper that match generally where they are in the battlefield. And when they cross streams, I get a little mixed up, but that's kind of a little cue for, for me and how to do it. Um, but uh, two other things you can do with when tracking damage for your, um, your monsters is one, and I learned this one just really recently, don't subtract damage from the hit point maximum add damage up to the hit point maximum hmm. so if, one, if someone does before. if someone does six points of damage and then does seven points of damage you just 13 and you keep adding it until it hits 52 which was their hit point maximum or higher because adding is way faster mentally for most people than subtraction especially we have to go around the zero uh and you kind of go uh, uh uh and realize that you're messed up uh, so that goes way faster and way easier. The other thing, and I don't highly recommend this, but it can be used really well judiciously and in certain circumstances, you can use narrative damage where, especially for a BBEG, like an ancient dragon or, you know, a god getting ready to ascend, don't give them hit points. Like know what range they're in especially high level stuff, right? Where your players are doing 150 points of damage on their turn. Um, you can just go, okay, I know about how many hit points and I'm generally tracking like a status bar in my head of where that is. And then narratively where it makes the most sense for you to put out more minions or for them to assume their final form or for this really great like smite, this final smite from the uh, from the paladin who's got like one hit point left, you're like, okay, that's it. That's the kill shot. Instead of someone doing like a magic missile for four points and that kills the monster. Like, no, come on. That, like, yeah. so I, I, I get the appeal of that style. And uh, like who we were, we were talking about Chris Solo earlier from uh, Fable 42, he does this a lot, especially with his big bads. Yeah. Um, and he does it really well because you would never know. And he just told us and we we're like, oh. Uh, but if you did that for like every orc and goblin, that's not going to go well. Um, uh, so again, it's a cool idea, but just use it very selectively. Yeah, right. and kind of going off of that, and also kind of what I said earlier about enjoyment is, uh, you know, if you have eleven goblins and you know your your players are flanked by three of them, and say they did seven points of damage and the goblin had nine points of health and and, and they didn't quite kill it. Like, screw that. Let your players be the hero. Like, take off those two points, you cleave the goblin's head off, and you go to the next one. Because, like, the look on their face whenever they, like, just one swipe through, you know, a, a foe or something like that, and then move on to the next one, like, that, it's just like giving a kid candy. They're so excited, yeah. and they feel so empowered. 
Yeah. Right. No, don't neglect the story for the mechanics. Yeah. yeah. Don't let math get in the way of a good time. Yeah. I mean, okay, that's kind of a hard one because D and D is all math. No. Mm. -mm. <laughs> Collaborative storytelling. That's right. Sprinkled with a heavy amount of math. Yes. Um, sprinkled okay. with differential calculus. So. <laughs> So we've got one last question here before we wrap up this episode. I saved the best or you, I guess you could say worst for last. And this is one that came up probably every two to three people. I mean, this was the heavy hitter. And can anybody guess what the biggest challenge is when it comes to playing D&D? &D? Uh, how to ask someone to leave your table. Scheduling. No. Oh, yes. scheduling oh. a How to get people session. at your table. Getting yeah. them there. If they're there, you can like then move on to more challenging things like asking them to leave, but people are having problems with scheduling and I totally feel it. Especially because a lot of us are adults and contrary to common belief, we are not all just like people that live in our parents' basement with no job or no life. Like We've got jobs, we've got things to do, and so coordinating all of us adults at one time can be a little bit challenging. And that's the number one challenge that people, from what I've seen, tend to face is scheduling. So what what have you guys done to try to overcome or deal with scheduling conflicts um, or getting people together you know, on a frequent enough basis that your story can feel like it's actually moving and unfolding? I would say it's set that expectation in the beginning, you know, kind of like we were talking about earlier, uh, like, hey, guys, you know, we want to play every week, every Thursday, um, you know, you know, coordinate with your families like, like how you can. Like for us, it's perfect because, you know, that Thursday night is uh, one of my guys' nights away from the kids. And then his wife gets Tuesday night. Um, you know, one of the guys, he uh, stays at work a little bit late that day and then just comes straight over from work. Um, but, you know, we've been together for a long time now, but I would definitely say like just setting that expectation like hey we want to play every week we want to play every other week and then you know just be communicative as i guess everything is in D. &D. yeah i i think too like you said yeah setting up the expectation even be specific about like okay so if you're going to join this game or i'm starting this game it's going to be every single thursday night except for like major holidays mm -hmm. it's going to start at seven and we're going to end at 10 10 30 every single night mm -hmm. Does that work for you on a weekly basis? Uh, and so they know what they're getting into. Like if they think it's going to be a three hour game and you're like, no, we played five hours, we played a midnight, man, then that's going to cause problems and you could have fixed that early on. Uh, also too, I find it's really helpful not to make you the DM, the hub of communication in that fact that you're trying to coordinate schedules with everyone else. So they're all texting you, but not talking to each other. So I recommend like getting something like Slack or GroupMe, which is really great. Um, and put everyone in that so that if someone's like, hey, I will be a half an hour late on Thursday or I can't make it this Thursday, everyone knows and they're like, oh, okay, no problem. But if someone was like, okay, I've got this thing at work, it's like a party, it's not required, but like it's kind of required and I should go to it. And then you see like two other people saying, hey, I'm not sure if I can make it. And another person saying, I can't make it. And then you're like, okay, I should just let him know, and now I know that we'll just be off this week because that's you know three fifths of the party, um, uh, and so that kind of that decentralization really helps with the communication, I think. Um, and then also just just let them know like uh, what you plan to do when someone can't make it. Like if two people can't make it, we'll still play if it, out of five or six. But if it's more than three, if three or more, we'll cancel. Uh, if you're the only person who's not there, um, narratively you are still there combat wise you are not there you do not get a turn in uh, combat so the rest of the party can feel that uh that lack um uh you can also make fun that fun with it i know that you uh, cameron post game do like uh mvp awards and that kind of thing uh, and give out like special dice and stuff um you could even be like hey if you're the first one here tonight uh doors open at 6 30 for the seven o'clock oh, game you're the first person here you get advantage you ring you bring uh, something to drink or eat too. Yep. You also get a luck point to start the game. Just saying, open to everybody. Uh, you know, if you're the last one here, your first roll is a disadvantage. Uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, but if you're, you know, some of your people are coming straight from work, and other people have kids, and like da, 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 Like, yeah, d don't penalize them for the for just their life. But if you're like you're all in college, or like just you know have lots of free time, and people are just late because they're just late, then maybe that could be fun. 
Uh, but I've never tried that, but now I'm thinking about it. <laughs> Don't set yourself for failure, though, because, like, if yeah. you know that, you know, if you got a buddy who's super into D&D and, you know, you, you want to start this campaign and you know that, like, he's not going to be a reliable person to be there every week, then just know that starting there and don't expect him to be there every week mm -hmm. uh, you know have an easy like pop in where you can take over his character like jason said you know maybe they just are really shooting like a pokeball like he's released yeah. like maybe like one of the people in this <laughs> campaign he has like ownership of, i don't know however you want to do it but uh and also utilizing the forms like on dnd beyond like when you're making your group that for me was a huge deal uh because basically it's like you post a job list, not like a job listing, but like a, a wanted ad. And then, you know, you say like what edition you're playing, how often you want to play with the day, the time. And hey, if this works for you, great. Let's try it out. If it doesn't work for you, then that's fine too. Then there's more groups out there. Right. Yeah. So, I mean, the key thing is really um, it's best to start off with a consistency, like a schedule. Mm -hmm. Like this will be this day, this time, every week or every two weeks instead of okay, we played tonight, you know, what, what should we, what time should we get together next week or what day works for everyone? Um, it kind of makes things a little bit more confusing. The other thing is too, I think is it's sometimes a lot easier to trap people into an answer when they're there. And so instead of texting everybody the day after your D and D session to be like, yeah, is everybody good for next week or however you do it when you end before everyone leaves, just have everyone pull out their phones and check their calendars to kind of verify or confirm if they have a vacation yeah. coming up or if they have an appointment because everyone's in the same room. You can do it in like three and a half minutes and then you're done and you don't have to worry about it. Yeah, yeah, because that, 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 that's really good because so there are some times where I have things in my calendar that I forgot existed until I looked at my calendar. I'm like, oh, yeah, I am not in the state this, that day. I'm sorry, I didn't even realize it until you asked me. So yeah, getting them to look at their phones then is awesome. Um, another thing too you could do, especially if it's a brand new group, especially like all new people, where they're like, yeah, I've been hearing about D&D and &D I wanted to play, right? So that they don't understand the commitment or whatever. Don't start a campaign, do a one shot. In mm -hmm. fact, if you're having trouble consistently with um, all the schedules aligning and you feel like, well, I think these two people are gonna actually drop out, but then like, there's this other guy who wants to bring his friend who might be really great, I don't know, and that uh, normal group is not yet solidified, do a couple weeks of D&D, &D, especially for brand new players to get them a, a different variety of play styles and, and settings and, and kinds of adventures. And then when that group locks in or they particularly enjoy one of the one shots that became episode one or session one of your new campaign mm -hmm. because now you've got them and now they're really involved in the story and if they end the session with a bunch of questions and saying well hey can we play this next week too there's your campaign right yeah and i mean even just letting people like if they're brand new like hey just this is what time we're playing come sit and hang out yeah. And then if they hang out and they like it and the schedule works, then they can join in. Or if there's that one person that like is really their schedule is just all over the place because of their work or whatever, like maybe they're just the NPCs in your campaign whenever they're able to show up, right? You just tell them like, you know, they sit next to you and you give them the character cards like you have, Cameron, and you're like, "Okay, you're going to deal, you're going to be all of the people in combat tonight. You're going to be this NPC." here's the information you need to know and they can still engage they can still have fun but they're not necessarily invested in the story or, or hurting the party in the same way if they're not there for that extra help during combat or some of those scenarios yeah, yeah. i like that all right do you guys have any final words of advice for people that are feeling challenged or have challenged uh challenges playing D D to finish out this episode with then today it's it's all a game you're here to have fun and enjoy it's just company. a game <laughs> game it's so easy to forget that yeah and it's you know, you put your heart and soul in, in into it and you know what if your players didn't act the way you expected them to or you know didn't turn out the way you wanted it to then that's okay that's totally fine yeah and i would say too just i mean kind of more meta not piece of advice but if you have watched or listened to this episode and 
hoping we would answer a specific question and we didn't, please reach out to either the compendium on Instagram, send a message. You can send a message to me at Critical Dice on Instagram. Uh, we check all of those messages and just say, hey, I listened to the episode. What about this? And maybe we can give you advice right then or there, or maybe we'll end up doing a second episode of this uh, you know, a few months down the line and have Cameron come back or uh, some other guest and uh, do some more of these. So, But uh, reach out to the DMs who have come before you. We all stand on the shoulders of giants, the, the men and women who have uh, learned the skills before us in ancient editions, and we need to learn from them. So, Absolutely. Thank you guys so much for joining us this week on The Compendium, where we are talking about all things D&D, helping you spend less time learning and more time actually playing. This episode was sponsored by The Critical Dice and The Endless Bag of Dice, where you can get a new set of dice delivered to your door every single month for as little as $6.99. Click on the link in the show notes to learn more. Make sure you subscribe to our channel if you enjoyed listening in this week so that you know every time we push out a new video. And also leave a comment below if you learned something new in this episode that you didn't know before. Thank you so much for listening in. We'll see you guys next time.